in the work that we do, Lord, uh, certainly it provides for our families, but our lives and our finances are not our own. Lord, they belong to you. And we thank you that we have had the privilege of helping our brothers and sisters in La Playita, Lord, to purchase property, a very expensive area, that they may have a church building. And we just thank you, Father, for that. We continue to pray for the growth of the church there. Uh, Lord, we also pray for Art and Vicki as, uh, as Art especially is um, mentoring men to become elders. Uh, however, the work there is such that, uh, that it's long hours and it's very difficult. So we just pray that you would raise up the right men to be elders at that church. We also ask, Father, that as the Reyes are growing older, like all of us, uh, there is a time where they must separate from that work. And we just pray for the man that would replace them. Lord, but most importantly, Lord, that you would bring people in, that they would hear the news, the salvation news of Jesus Christ, and that lives would be changed, Lord, and that you would be glorified through it. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful opportunity to pray for them and the fact that God doesn't need us, but he wants us and uses us for his glory in those wonderful ways. Why don't we stand together for our call to worship this morning, which comes out of Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. And why don't we read this together to our God. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. We notice how God-centered that passage is. He is the aim, the theme of our praise. When we consider all he is, the earth, the heavens, can't even contain his glory. And we think of Jesus, it's because of him we are welcomed into his presence through the precious blood of his son to worship him and sing to him. Now, before I turn it over to Brother Jeremy, why don't we take this time briefly to meet and greet one another before we sing. Good to be back with you, brothers and sisters. Um, welcome for those who are here for the first time. Um, we're here to hail the power of Jesus' name, and that's what we're going to sing right now. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal. Yonder sacred 
join. We'll join the everlasting song and crown
has blessed us in our Savior with every spiritual prize. He shouldered my shame, gave me your name, no longer enemy, now friend, shout out your praise, glorious grace, you will now keep salvation hope and power in me forgiveness rich inheritance predestined for your purpose holy spirit guarantee i've been given everything you shouldered my Psalm 138, 1 and 2. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word.
Amen. Why don't we bow our heads before our God this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for you. God, we thank you for your salvation. God, though none of us are deserving, though none of us are worthy, you are not obligated to show mercy to any. God, you freely chose in such amazing grace to set your love on the least of these. God, we are so thankful that this morning, though we are unworthy, we are welcomed in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those of us who are covered in his blood, clothed in his righteousness, God, we come before you as sons and daughters who are welcome to sit at the king's table. God, I pray this morning our joy would derive from the finished work of your son upon the cross. God, it's so easy, even for myself, that my joy is derived from circumstances, my joy is derived from my performance. God, those things are wavering. God, my unfaithfulness is so consistent at times. But God, your faithfulness, your son and his finished work is unchanging. God, and we rest in that this morning as we come to you. Lord, as we come to hear your word, I pray for Brother Bob as he comes to preach your word this morning, God, that you would encourage him God, that you would compel his heart to preach your word, that we may see Christ this morning. And I pray for our hearts in the pews. God, only you can break the stony ground. Only you can take your word, not just to the ears, but to the hearts. God, I pray that you would break our hardened hearts and soften them, God. And would we receive your word as what it really is, the word of God and not the words of men. God, I thank you that we can come and gather what joy is in gathering as your people. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room, God, who may not know Jesus Christ, truly, God, they may know about him, they may know facts from scripture about him, verses, but may not actually truly know him intimately, savingly. God, would you draw them to your son this morning, that they may see the radiance of the glory of Christ in the gospel. God, I pray for Music Fest coming up. God, I pray that many of us would volunteer to go out um, during that event, God, the two weekends of that in August, that we would just be captured by Christ and compelled by him to take his gospel to the community around us, that us as a church would go in our community, God, and that we would be in obedience to you in that way, God, that we would have such a heart to see people come to know Jesus, but not only that, to be discipled in the local church. God, I pray for our church that we would continue to grow, especially in the midst of this time, that you would continue to grow us in unity, continue to grow us in faithfulness, God, in love for you and one another as Paul prayed for the Colossians. God, I pray for the search committee as they continue to meet, God, consistently just pouring their hearts out before your face in prayer. God, in all the time that's been going into that, Lord, that we would continue to trust you, God, work in their hearts, continue to give them wisdom and guidance and discernment. And I pray us as a church, we continue to rest in your faithfulness, God, that we would trust you and that we would be patient in this time. Oh, Lord, I pray this morning for those who are hurting, those who maybe could not make it, God, those who are homebound, those who are sick, those who are watching through the live stream, God, those in the midst this morning in this room who may be hurting, going through a rough time. God, I pray that they would be comforted greatly with your word this morning. Oh God, that they would cling all the more to Jesus and us as a church would be ones that bear one another's burdens, praying for one another, forgiving one another as we've been forgiven of you. Oh, would you be worshiped, I pray, in spirit and truth and I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I wanna encourage you at this time to take your fellowship pad, um, where you can find a sermon guide in there. You could fill your name out there and then pass it along in your pew so everyone gets an opportunity to grab one of those to follow along with the sermon. Um, And again, if you are new with us this morning, maybe it's your first, your second, or even your third time visiting with us, we are so thankful that you have been brought here by God this morning. Um, And just a refresher, um, the newcomers lunch after second service today at 1245. We'd love to see you there, but we'd also love to connect with you um, if you would fill out a connect card in your pew in front of you, 
Um, you could drop that in the offering plate as it comes around, or if you don't get an opportunity to do that, you can go online to a placeforyou.org slash connect, because we desire to get to know you, answer any questions you may have, and connect with you and share the heart of the ministry here at Ebenezer. So at this time, I want to invite the um, gentleman forward to receive the offering as we give just a portion back to God of what he's already given to us in abundance. Well, good morning. <clears throat> We're studying the church, if you haven't figured that out by now. And um, one of the things I've noticed along the, year, along the way is that when pastors are being searched and looked at for a, a particular church, you have to put together some sort of a job description. What is it you want this guy to do? I mean, really. What do you want him to do? If we were to take a poll right now of everybody in the room and say, what do you think the new pastor should do? How should he spend his time? How much time each week should he even spend? It, there wouldn't be unanimity in that. There'd be all sorts of questions. Well, I, I've seen that exercise done uh, with search committees and with boards of elders. And it's interesting to look at the results. How long should a pastor, to make it easy, what, what normally happens is you get a list of activities. How long should a pastor pray in a week? How long should a pastor study? How long should he be in meetings? How much should he visit? And you can imagine the list. I don't have time to go on the entire list. And then the exercise is such that you ask everybody to put down a number of hours and then add them up. And how many hours a week do you think it comes to? Somewhere between 80 and 120 
It's a ridiculous number to ask of anybody, especially someone who actually has a family and uh, would like to spend a little bit of time with them. It's a curious thing, but you know, I, I serve as a, a surrogate elder for a few smaller churches that don't have any elders. So the executive board and the board of church health appoints people, and since I'm retired, I'm usually available. And in some of those churches, there isn't anybody else. It's just the pastor. That's it. I got a list from one pastor who was getting ready to retire, and he was helping us find his replacement. And the list was everything he does in a, in, in a month or a week or whatever it is. And the list included answering the phone, opening the church, closing the church, setting the heat, renewing all the contracts with all the different contractors, the heat, the oil, the gas, whatever it was, getting the grass cut, shoveling the snow, going to the post office to pick up the mail because there was no mail delivery at the church, and preaching and doing Bible studies and praying and going to the hospital and doing all kinds of visitation. The list was a page and a half long, single-spaced, of all these activities. It was amazing how much that man did. And year after year, the church got smaller and smaller and smaller. You see, that's not what the church is about. We don't walk into a church with a little scorecard and saying, how's the pastor doing? Is he meeting my expectations? The first year I was in church, one of the old timers, it was a very Dutch congregation to some degree. So I'm a little bit Pennsylvania Dutch somewhere in my background. And this very Dutch man who was a painter, one of the, the dearest men in the church, he said to me, Pastor, you better be nice to us. We pay your salary. I said, no, you don't. What do you mean we don't? Of course we do. I said, no, you don't. The Lord does. The Lord pays my salary. I said, whatever I need, he supplies. He didn't quite know what to do with that because he thought he had a little, little wedge over me. He's a dear man. He was. He really was. I miss him. Well, that's not church. At least it's not the way the church is supposed to be. The church is you. The pastor is a shepherd. He's not a hired hand. And his, his goal is to use you in the way God foreordained for you to be used to be all that you can be in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. That's the pastor's real role. Oh yeah, he's going to do all those things on the list along the way. Now, you remember we said in the beginning, Jesus said in the beginning of this study of the church, that I will build my church, his church, and he's building it. And he's building it his way. He didn't ask for our advice. And the church was told right at the ascension, after the resurrection, naturally, to wait for his power and for his direction. And then we said last week, the church is called to stay on mission, not get distracted. Well, in this early church, I keep getting stuck at Acts 2 because that's where it all all sort of happened. And we won't be there very long, so don't bother turning there. We'll be in 1 Corinthians 12 if you want to get a head start. But in the early days, the ministry was 50 people, and then it began to grow. Peter spoke, 3,000 got saved. That was quite an amazing feat. In Acts 2, verse 45, it said, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In the next couple of chapters, the church begins to shape itself. In Acts 5, the apostles, it says, did many miracles and signs. None of the rest, other than believers, were willing to join them. And it said, more than ever, believers were added to the multitudes of both men and women, were added to the Lord. So the apostles are being used. It went from Peter to the rest of the apostles being used. And then, then as the church got a little bit bigger, they began to be limited in what they could do. And the Greeks, Gentiles, 
who were believers, said, our people aren't getting served correctly. You're only serving your people. You're only serving the Jews. So they had a congregational meeting, first evidence of a congregational meeting. And they, it was a very positive meeting, apparently, and they chose seven to serve. It says in Acts 6.1, In these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint came up. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, we shouldn't give up praying, we shouldn't give up the word, so pick others to do this work. And they picked others. The number of people involved in the administration of the church is growing. It wasn't just the select few. It wasn't just the elders, or in their case, the apostles. And then, a little bit later, in Acts 11... They hear that the church has expanded, it's in Antioch, so they send Barnabas, they send somebody else. He wasn't one of the mainstream, perhaps, in the beginning at least. So they send him. And you get the idea, as the church grows, it keeps drawing people in and using different people in different ways and in different opportunities. Now, to make it somewhat simple, you're the church. You were the ones drawn together in this particular location, And I'm constantly fascinated by the concept that all of you are unique and you're different in so many different and interesting, sometimes annoying ways. So what do we do with that? 1 Corinthians 12, beginning of the chapter. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another for the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, are these, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as in one body, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. I want to concentrate just on one verse pretty much to guide us. I've read a bunch of commentaries, and John Piper leans on this particular verse, as do a few others, and I agree with him or I wouldn't use it. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Just sort of take that. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You probably wouldn't write a sentence like that. Manifestation's not a word we use a lot. But just look at it. To each. Who's included in this idea of spiritual gifts? Now, this is going to be broad-based. This is not specifics about spiritual gifts. You could do a whole series about spiritual gifts. And the list he gives here is not all-inclusive. It's just some to make his point. Who's included? Each one. If you're a member of the church, what that means is you've come before the elders and said you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, which means, since you are a believer, that you are part of the body of Christ. But we all start on a level playing ground. We are all there. But it says we have all been given a gift by the Holy Spirit. When it comes to spiritual gifts, we don't all get the same ones. We don't all get the same list. We don't even have all the same gifts all the time, I suspect. I can't prove that. But we all have at least one gift. So no matter who you are, no matter what low opinion you might have of yourself, because a lot of people apparently do, you're important. You were given a gift by God. You can do certain things 
that very few other people can do. You have a passion or a heart for certain things that perhaps other people don't. You're unique. You're important. You make this church different to each one. No one is left behind. No one. The church is a gathering of particular people who are given particular gifts, talents, abilities, and resources to use for the glory of God. That's Christ building his church. He brought you here. He gave you a gift. He wanted you to do this. He said, well, I want something different. That's the way we are, isn't it? I, I, I like his gift. I want, I want that. He, say, he gave them as he will. What do you do? What do you do with somebody who wants to use a gift they don't have? There's an interesting dilemma. I had somebody, dear, dear man, godly man, one of the most faithful people in the church the whole time I was there, not only to the church, but to me. He was an elder for many, many, many years. He had the gift of taking a Sunday school class from 50 people down to two. And he did it repeatedly. What do you do with that? His gift was not teaching, at least not to a large class. He was a wonderful man of prayer. He was a righteous man. He was a good example in many different ways. He was great teaching people and mentoring people one-on-one. -on -one. I went to him one Sunday after I'd been there a few years, and I said, Brother... I said, I have the perfect place for you. I want you to mentor these young men. He did a fabulous job. We had to get him out of that Sunday school class. I had somebody else with a heavy Dutch accent, even to the, the consonants he'd use at the end of the words that sort of came out with a little bit of spit, I think. And he wanted to sing. And he wanted to sing solos with that heavy Dutch accent. And he was a little off key. So we had this discussion at the elder board. I said, well, he wants to sing, he should be allowed to sing. I said, but nobody wants to listen to him. Well, that doesn't matter, one elder said. If I wanted to sing, you should let me sing. I said, I will never let you sing. You only know one note. <laughs> and the question then comes back to, if you can't sing, why do you want to? Well, that's another whole issue, isn't it? And you need to handle all that with grace, with love, and with care. And the, the goal of a pastor is not to be authoritarian like that, but to shepherd them and help them find their gifts so that they'll not only mature in the faith, but grow in it and blossom in it and enjoy it. No one enjoys being bad. The congregation doesn't enjoy it. It used to drive me up the wall and make me question even some of the compliments after a, an occasional sermon, when people would walk by and say to him, that was great, and I'm sitting there thinking, no, it wasn't. It was bad. And don't encourage him. I never said any of that. That was my self-talk. But, but then I'm reminded of that when people say, oh, that was a great sermon. I say, yeah, what do you really think? And I don't care what you think. I'm more interested in what the Lord enables you to remember down the road and how maybe it changed your life. If I want to know how the sermon really was, I'll ask my wife and she will tell me. Usually without me asking, but uh, <laughs> who's included? Each one. Each one. Hang on to that idea. It's not enormously profound, but it's incredibly important. Secondly, how do you know Either that you have a spiritual gift, or how do you know which one it might be? The manifestation thing. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation. You know what a manifestation is? It's like a ghost appearing. The appearing of the ghost would be a manifestation. You know one of the problems with churches like ours? 
is we have lo- either lost the ability the manifestation, I must have blocked something, the manifestation of the Spirit, or we never learned it. If you go to a charismatic church, they have it. In, in fact, I think they have a few people assigned to manifest. I'm fairly certain about that, actually. There's always somebody to speak in tongues. There it is, the, the Lord's here. We were at a church one time, a charismatic church, and they took a long time getting started. And I noticed that the people were wandering in for the first 20 minutes, and the people who were wandering in were actually the people in the band, in the worship team. For 20 minutes, they're just sort of wandering in. It's like we had an appointment with God, but we're late. Would you be late if he was sitting on the platform and you were supposed to be here at 10 o'clock? Would you be late? I don't think so. But they were late, and they were starting, and then finally somebody got up, we're a charismatic church, let's stop moaning and groaning and let's act like it. I said to my wife, I think we're holding back the spirit, perhaps we should leave. And we did. Because they were all about acting something out. It wasn't a free, natural flowing of the spirit of God, but for them, and this is the theological difference, for them, it was somebody standing up and speaking in what they consider tongues. We believe from Scripture that tongues is a foreign language. It's not Babel. And when someone stands and speaks in tongues, if you follow Scripture, what Paul wrote, then someone else will stand up and interpret. And many, in particular, Assemblies of God churches are very careful to have that done and to limit people who speak where there's no one there to interpret. The interpretations often sound like a psalm somebody's memorized. But for them, my point is not to criticize them. My point is, for them, there it is. That's the manifestation of the Spirit. What is it for us? How do you know? Is it because a certain song made you feel warm and fuzzy? Or something raised the hair on the back of your head? Or your neck, if you didn't have any on the back of your head. But what is it that tells you the Spirit of God is manifesting. I think what it is, is when you see the various spiritual gifts begin to blossom in various people. Look around. I had a friend from England, a business associate, years and years ago, before I was in the ministry, came to church. And he wasn't a believer. He was open. He was curious. And he said... And some of these people, I see light. I said, really? <clears throat> he said, yeah. He, he said, there's just something different about them that, that almost shines out. I honestly didn't quite know what to do with that. I think he was seeing in some of the people he pointed to the manifestation of the Spirit of God. I traveled in Africa once with Dana Weller on a pastor's mission trip. And uh, my missions director and came over after the week, and we went down into uh, Tanzania. And we're staying with a missionary in a, in a very rough circumstances. He's, he, was, he was in his mid-70s then, I think, career missionary himself, who had come back from Iran when the Ayatollah kicked everybody out. And he's, the missionary is a little upset. Missionary was youngish, and and uh, had a young family, was, was there all the time. But he's, he's upset about, well, the, the, the truck isn't working properly, the shocks are shot, uh, we, we have a leaky roof, and, and he had a, a list of things that were sort of grievances that he was sort of fussing with. And here's this older missionary, old by most definitions, I guess, and he's waking up from, he was given the cement floor to sleep on, And it rained that night, and there was a drip that was right over his head. And he found some plastic, and he slept under the plastic on the floor. And he wakes up the next morning, and he goes, it's a bright, cheery day for the Lord. And he meant it. It wasn't a put on. It was who he was. I've said to people repeatedly, I think he might be the godliest man I've ever met. He was just unassuming. I got mad at him once for something stupid. 
And, and he came up to me and said, Pastor, you should know I'm not like that. I said, you're right, I do, I'm sorry. I said, unfortunately, I'm a little bit like that, so I, we need to get over that. But, but he was, is, he's still around, just a godly man. When you let the Spirit work in your life, the manifestation is far more important than those things we might see on a television rally or something. It's lives being changed. If you look close at your congregation, you will see the Holy Spirit working in individual people. Oh, they might not glow, but you'll see they're more loving, they're more tolerant, they're more caring. They're more instantly driven to prayer. And they help people. But it all shows up in slightly different ways. How do you know the Spirit's at work? He reveals himself through the people he's working in and through. He gives a list, short list, wisdom, insight into doctrinal truth. Some people you go to naturally because they're wise about Scripture. Knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, the ability to distinguish spirits, tongues, the interpretation of tongues. There's a list in Romans. I mean, there's, there's lots of them. I don't even think the Bible contains all the spiritual gifts. It's an idea that the Spirit is working in all of you to equip you in the way you need to be equipped. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so with yourselves, since you're eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. And, and why do we have these? Well, there it is in that same verse, for the building up of the church, for the common good, back in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Back in Acts 2, they had everything in common. 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The stewards, have you ever considered yourself as a steward of the grace of God? We talk about the grace of God a lot. Do you realize you're the steward of it? You're like the magnifying glass that the sun goes through when you shine it on a piece of paper to make the paper burn, if you remember that exercise from probably elementary school or something. You're that magnifying glass to magnify the love and the grace of God in the lives of other people. That's why we have the gifts, not for ourselves, but for others. Use it to serve one another, building up physical care of others in the church. Evangelism is part of that as well. You ever noticed in evangelism how certain people have that gift? Oh, we're all supposed to share the gospel, but certain people have that gift. I was once in a Bible school, and I was, my role in the Bible school was to put on a gorilla suit and be a gorilla. And the gorilla was a talking gorilla, which is problematic. And the gorilla at the end of Bible school got saved, which is also problematic. But nonetheless, that was it. So at the end of Bible school, this big evangelistic youth guy, youth pastor we had, introduced me to do the concluding talk to the parents as the church's Billy Graham. And I'm sitting there back, why did he say that? I'm not that in any way, shape, or form. I may be a lot of things, but I'm not that. But it sort of stuck with me, and I can be a ferocious mimic without meaning to. If I hear an accent, my ear picks it up and I can... Well, I was thinking about Billy Graham, so I, I walked out to speak to the people, and the whole idea at the end of a Bible school is to simply give the gospel. That's to the parents. And I start to speak with a slightly southern accent, with all the phrases that Billy Graham would use, and even to the invitation. It was the Billy Graham invitation. I had seen some of his crusades. I, I wasn't thinking to do it, it just came out. I ask people to raise their hands or raise their head, you know, bow for prayer, raise your head. If you... 20 people got saved. And I thought, what was that? That Billy Graham working through me? 
It was the Spirit of God working through me. And the moment was prepared, and perhaps I'd accidentally copied some clear way to get me out of the way and present the gospel. But some people are like that. I'm not, normally. Some people are. And if that's not you, don't feel guilty. Don't, don't feel bad. You, your job in presenting the gospel might just be in the classic planting seeds for the person who really is gifted as an evangelist to come and to pick the fruit. That doesn't let you off the hook. But don't feel bad. The results are all his, not ours. And how are we supposed to use these gifts? Through the Holy Spirit again. There it is. The manifestation of the Spirit. In this whole period that we were, chapter or paragraph that we read earlier, each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. One is given through the Spirit, according to the Spirit, by the same Spirit, by one Spirit, by one and the same Spirit. All empowered by the Holy Spirit. As you pray, be open to the leading of the Spirit. As we said two weeks ago, when you pray, be quiet and listen to the Spirit of God speak to you. Not just about who maybe to pray for, or who to go visit, or who to help, but maybe about how you can enhance the gift that he's given you. Each one is unique. Each one will look different. So you can't copy people, as much as I tried to copy Billy Graham. You can't do that. We're not meant to do that. We are meant to be us. He brought you here now. Why? Because you're an important piece of what he's building here. And he has gifted you in unique ways for the jobs, the, the opportunities he has, not just today, but tomorrow and all the tomorrows that there are. How does the Holy Spirit work? I don't know all the answers to that, but in John, you remember the passage in John? Jesus said, when he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. He'll guide you into all truth, it says a little bit later, and he'll glorify Christ. He'll convict the world of all sin. You know, when you pray for a loved one and they don't get saved, do you feel guilty? If you shared Christ with them repeatedly and they don't respond, do you feel bad, like you're doing something wrong? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we feel like it's our fault. I heard a mission speaker a long, long time ago, unfortunately I forget who it was, say, if you don't share Christ with this person, they might go, they might go to hell. A Christless eternity. It'll be your fault. No. I don't believe that. I don't believe Scripture says that. I don't believe he'll condemn anyone because I was disobedient. I won't get the blessing of having been used by God. If I don't show up, somebody will, somebody else will, I think. That's part of the grace of God. It doesn't let us off the hook, though. We're called to be used. We will never be what we can be. I say that often about the church, but that's true about us. If we limit the working of the Holy Spirit in us, we won't be as satisfied with life as we'd like to be. We won't have accomplished all that God created us to accomplish. We won't have fulfilled the purpose that God had for us from the beginning. Will always be short. It's exciting to know that God loves me so much, not only did he send Christ to save me, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower me and teach me and use me to his glory. That my life might actually matter for something. That it'll count for something. That's huge. That's a huge piece of the faith. Paul gives an unusual analogy at the end of this particular chapter. He uses the body to an extreme. I'm sure you've read it before. The body doesn't consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, 
what would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? And as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Look around the room. Look at your church gatherings. And look at the individual people. There may be some people that you really like, and maybe some you don't like so much. A group this large is good news. Bound to be a little bit of that, although you would certainly none of us would ever admit it. But now look around the room at all those people, the good, bad, and the indifferent ones to you, and think that person is important to God. Not just because all people are important to God, but that person is important to God because He brought them here them in different ways. And he's using them in ways I don't have a clue. We talk about someday in glory. Imagine someday in glory if they say, the Ebenezer Church from 2022 is having a meeting tomorrow. We have eternity. It could happen. And at that meeting, Jesus is going to be presiding. And we're going to invite each one now that we have full knowledge and glory, to share what God enabled them to do for the glory of God while they were here in this life. And you're sitting there. Forget about what you're going to say. What are you going to hear? What are you going to hear from everybody else? And what's your reaction going to be? I never knew that. He did that? She did that? Really? God used them that way? That's what it's going to be. You see, that's what God's doing. You're a part of a remarkable organization that God is using and empowering. Everyone is gifted. Everyone. Everyone is important. Back in 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So with yourselves, since you're eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, and I suspect we all are, strive to excel in building up the church. You want to see the Holy Spirit in your life? Look for ways that you can help build up others within the church. And you'll begin to see the manifestation of the Spirit of God in you. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for the building up of the church. That's the organization of the church. It's never meant to be the pastor doing it all. The biggest single mistake pastors of usually small churches is they do it all themselves. I talked to a pastor once, a number of years ago, and he said, we lost a few key people and I have to type the bulletin. And I have to, the list I gave you before almost, I have to open the building and close the building and, and I drive the bus to pick up some kids and I do all this, that, and the other thing. I said, stop doing it. What do you mean? I said, you can't find somebody to do the bulletin, don't do a bulletin. Well, the people will be upset. I said, let them be upset. You don't have a lot of people, but somebody could do the bulletin. It doesn't have to be you. He said, well, that was a novel idea. All of you. All of you are important. If you remember nothing else, remember this. All of you are important. All of you have a gift that is integral to this church being all that it can be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. In all ways, in all circumstances, and Lord, thank you that you use us to be the agents of that grace. I pray for all of us, Lord, that we be open to the leading of your Spirit not just in what we should do, but how we should change. That we should be bold enough to step out in faith, knowing that you'll use us in each circumstance in some way, usually beyond our understanding. Lord, I pray for anyone that has come today thinking less of themselves than they should. And maybe for those thinking more of themselves than they should too. But Lord, I pray that we would submit our lives to you, recognizing we're all important to you to be used, 
None of us so arrogantly that it all depends on us, but all of us contributing to the work that you're doing. Lord, bless these folks as they step forward in faith and use the gifts and abilities and talents that you've given them for your glory. And may others see the manifestation of the Spirit of God in them and in this church, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Bob. Let's stand together as we sing just what we were reminded of through the preaching of the word that we as the body of Christ are to demonstrate the love the Father has given to us, uh, to the world, and to show that we are the hope of Christ as the church. Let's sing together. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of his faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to reign. Us into love forever. Oh, and we are the people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts. How great is the love of the Father. Lifted from darkness and into the light the sons and the daughters are loved at a price our God has made us his forever and we are the people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts how great Such a price. This is love. This is love. And when the Father calls us home, and we see Him on the throne, hear the voices sing as one. This is love. This is love. singing, I just had a thought, lest I get myself in too much trouble. If you can't sing, and you can only sing one note, the Lord delights in hearing you sing anyway. He does. All I meant was, you shouldn't sing a solo up front. <laughs> it's important to learn what the church is and what it isn't. Next week, we're going to talk about the things Jesus did not do. Fascinating study. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.